The CMS Migration Expert Series is brought to you by the Center for Migration Studies of New York. Michael W. Doyle is the director of the Columbia Global Policy Initiative and university professor of Columbia University, affiliated with the School of International and Public Affairs, the Department of Political Science, and the Law School. At Columbia, he co-directs a migration project which, together with an international commission, is leading the drafting of a model international mobility convention that defines the rights and responsibilities of individuals who cross borders and the states they leave, transit, and enter. Professor Doyle sat down with CMS to discuss the International Mobility Convention, including the need for the convention, the process behind its drafting, and next steps. The Model International Mobility Convention is designed to fill important gaps in the regimes, the laws for refugees and migrants. It, it seeks to achieve complementarity as well as comprehensiveness. With regard to comprehensiveness, it tries to fill in rules and regulations for the many people not covered by the two major conventions, the Refugee Convention of 1951 and the Migrant Workers Treaty of 1990. It, there's a lot of many categories that are left out, everything from tourists and students to f forced migrants when we get to the Refugee Convention, which only covers refugees. So it's filling gaps. But the more important, and, or at least equally important, aim of the convention, what it's designed to address, is to create compatible incentives for states as well as migrants and refugees to embed better protections at the same time as states have a greater reason to comply with the convention. So those are its purposes. Complementarity, filling in the gaps, comprehensiveness, and creating a complementary set of incentives so that we have a treaty that's more likely to be uh, implemented and complied with than the current uh, set of international legal rules. It, it came again from this motivation that we needed a, a better regime, um, a, uh, a model of what the laws should be for both migrants and refugees. Uh, the model was to fill the gaps, build upon the Refugee Convention and the Migrant Workers uh, Convention. So those were the starting points, filling the gaps in those two major treaties. Uh, what we did then is to assemble uh, many of the very best uh, scholars of international migration and refugees, including Don Kerwin, but also Guy Goodwin-Gill, Alex Alenikoff, Joel Trackman, Susan Martin, um, Kathleen Newland, many others participated in this process. And together, working as a commission, we then set about revising chapter by chapter, article by article, uh, for, for the sake of creating a new and better convention that reads like a treaty, uh, and, but that includes stronger protections for the human rights uh, and other rights of migrants and refugees, and a set of policies and procedures and commitments that makes this regime more attractive to states of both origin and destination. With regard to the protections for refugees, we take a number of important uh, steps forward. Uh, we add gender to the protections against persecution that are now available for things such as race, religion, political opinion, social group, etc. For, again, for refugees, uh, refugees now have the right to be treated as aliens in the countries in which they achieve uh, asylum. We think that fully certified refugees should be treated as nationals, that is, have rights to access to employment, to education, to social housing, social protections, equivalent to those of national citizens once they become recognized as refugees in the country. The other really big gap is that the convention, the 1951 convention, wonderful as it is, as a human rights landmark, 
doesn't include protections for many other people who are fleeing for their lives, who are fleeing because they otherwise would not survive, uh, who need protection and have to cross borders to get that protection. And so we're talking about people who are fleeing generalized violence or, or civil wars or even uh, imminent starvation or other forms of social com uh, collapse which directly threaten their lives. And these people we call forced migrants, and they deserve to have many of the same protections that refugees have from the standpoint of basic human uh, support and solidarity. So those are some of the major changes that we add for refugees, including forced migrants. For um, labor migrants and others, we add in uh, uh, protections, uh, better protections, especially for temporary migrants. Uh, many countries will not allow in people to work legally, fully documented, because they're concerned that doing so under the 1990 Migrant Workers Convention leads to too many um, uh, offers of social protection, social housing, education, full health care expenses, etc. So there's a real room to provide win-win solutions to workers who want to work in other countries, but to countries that are not ready to fully commit to full permanent uh, documented workers. And so we've established a stronger regime for temporary workers that includes important basic provisions of protection of basic rights, including emergency health care and the right to be protected uh, where needed by unions and other protections. And at the same time, we add in provisions that are new for multiple visas so that temporary workers have an easier opportunity to maintain close ties with their families and communities from the countries they come from. And we introduce provisions for portable pensions so that the uh, pensions that they earn while working in a foreign country are available to them when they return home, if they return home. And we also include a provision of a time limitation of five years so that no one becomes a permanent temporary worker. That is, after five years of working, the opportunity to become a, a regular, certified, documented, green card worker in a country is automatically made available to such people. Those are two important innovations in the, in the treaty. Oh, we hope so. That is, this commission of you know, 30 plus individuals worked very hard to try to solve in a progressive way the need to protect human rights and at the same time to advance the interest of states of destination and also of origin. So I think we solve a few difficult intellectual problems, which I hope that the two compacts will address, the one for refugees, the one for migrants, that they'll find good raw material here. But we should be clear, this treaty is much more ambitious than what is now taking place in the two compacts. The two compacts are very much governed by the common denominators of the existing states that are participating in uh, the discussion of the two compacts. So we shouldn't uh, exaggerate what is likely to come out of the compacts. This treaty is much more ambitious. It's designed to be what we call a realistic utopia. That is, it's designed for countries, nations, states, peoples, pretty much as they are, but we imagine them to be more strongly and better motivated to protect the rights of migrants and refugees, uh, taking into account the need to fulfill national interest of states of destination and origin. So it won't be as, the compacts won't be as ambitious as this treaty. This treaty is designed to set a, a standard over the horizon, uh, something that in the next 10 to 15 years, we hope that states can advance toward. Uh, in the way of providing a better set of laws to protect migrants and refugees. Our champions right now are the commission members who wrote it. That is, the 30-some individuals who have been invited to sign this uh, convention over the next few months. Once that process is complete, which will be sometime in late September, we will then open it up to signature to all individuals who support it. And so it will be available on a website and individuals will be invited to sign on to the treaty to express their support. 
and then we will promote it, uh, commission members and anyone else who would care to, in meetings around the world so that the uh, understanding of the treaty is, uh, is deepened and broadened. We plan meetings right now in Sao Paulo in August, in Barcelona in December, a couple in New York, uh, in October, in November, Salt Lake, Vancouver, Paris. These are the scheduled meetings, and we're talking about the prospect of meetings in Mumbai, in Beijing, maybe even Nairobi, uh, so that we can build a grassroots uh, uh, degree of understanding and support for the need for these kinds of uh, protections for migrants and refugees. If that all goes really well, we would hope that NGOs and international organizations like UNHCR and International Organization for Migration might well pick this up. And our moonshot, you know, the remote hope that glimmers sort of in the backs of our minds is that sometime in the future, uh, a group of well-motivated countries might pick this up and use it as the raw material for a real convention, a real treaty that they would write to provide better protections for migrants and refugees. Not unlike, for example, the way in which uh, many years ago Canada picked up uh, an NGO effort to ban landmines and eventually turned that into the Landmines Convention when uh, a wider degree of support uh, came forward on that important initiative. So that's what we're hoping for. But in the short term, we're trying to create a more coherent document that will relieve people's concerns about whether we can truly protect migrants and refugees and at the same time protect the legitimate interest of countries of destination and countries of origin. Our aim, as I've expressed, is to come up with win-win solutions that better protect the security and sovereignty concerns of states at the same time as they better protect the rights of migrants and refugees. For example, for states of destination, they're very concerned about who is coming across their border. So as part of this convention, we require that all of the states that someday, hypothetically, sign on to this will agree to having higher uh, tech uh, passports. Uh, that is, with biometric identifiers, so that countries have a better way of knowing who actually is crossing their border, maybe even make it easier to keep track of them. Uh, so that'll solve some of the anxieties that we see in countries now deeply concerned about the security of their borders. Think the United States, think the Europeans, and think a number of others. So we're addressing some of those concerns. We're also creating a more safe, orderly, and, and regular regime for migrants and refugees that will benefit both the migrants and refugees, of course, but also states of destination and origin, making it more likely that individuals will move because they're wanted and documented and less likely that they're moving because they're being driven out of their countries or for other reasons. And if they are really being driven out of their countries, more likely that they will get a genuine welcome when they arrive in countries of asylum. We're insisting, for example, that responsibility be shared so that all countries uh, contribute either to funding or resettlement so that we get away from the current uh, uh, situation, whereby 85% of the world's refugees are being taken care of by developing countries. That's not the right assignment of responsibility. The wealthier countries, the bigger countries, should play a fair share of responsibility in that regard. And we're attempting to make sure that people uh, move in response to genuine demand for their skills and labor, when we look at migrant labor, for example. So we're going to create a, uh, a, a, a jobs platform, an electronic, digital, internet jobs platform, where countries can identify the kinds of uh, missing skills or, um, or uh, employment opportunities that they have, that they would like to have filled, so that they can be filled by visa-holding documented workers who want to move to those countries, either temporarily or long-term. So it's designed to address the interest of both the migrants and refugees, as well as the countries that are, are their hosts, 
uh, their new countries of, of livelihood as well as the countries they leave. The most important thing is that this convention represents a, a whole series of long discussions over two years amongst a, a substantial commission uh, working to come up with you know, better solutions for migrants, refugees, and the countries that uh, they move between. Uh, but this will only succeed if we widen the understanding of it and our support. So we're hoping that anyone who's listening to this video, watching it, will take the trouble to read the convention, which is available online, and uh, if they find it persuasive, to uh, sign up to it so that we can uh, spread its uh, influence and maybe even inspire people in these very difficult times for migrants and refugees with what a, a better, more reasonable uh, future would well look like. That's our hope.